Okay, now, I, t- I said a little bit the other day how, you know, we, we have these little poems and things about how, man, you know, life is just a poor actor struts and frets, he's a pow- hour upon the stage, and, and uh, you know, life's a bitch, and then we die, and, and you know, because these are philosophies that people have when they live a miserable life, you know, and then, you know, we sing songs about it, you know, what's it all about, Alfie, you know, or uh, Peggy Lee, you know, is that all there is? Is that all there is? Is that all there is to life? Is that the best it got to offer? You know, all those things. Well, if you're human, you have problems. So, you know, I don't care if you're born into royalty and you don't need to worry about earning a living or any of that stuff and you're catered to and servants and everything else. You still have problems. You still get sick. You still have frustrations. You still have romantic heartaches and breakups. You still you still have all that stuff. You still have fears. You still know you're going to die. You know. So uh, the things that you have that other people covet, you you don't even see the value in it because you always had it. So you're not any more happy. You know, which just proves this whole thing that you know if you don't suffer evil, you don't know good. You know. You know, you do without for a long time, and then you get something. You say, wow, I really appreciate this. This is good. I'm thankful for this. You know, not that maybe you're never never thankful in the past, but you're especially thankful, you know. I mean, if somebody's out on a, a raft in the ocean, or somebody's out in the desert, and they think they're finished, they're going to die, and then when they go on their last hundred feet, they look, and there's a farmhouse, and there's water. I mean, wow, you know, it's a, what a marvelous feeling. And yet you're not going to have anything better there than that poor dirt farmer has. But boy, are you thankful for it, you see. But it just doesn't matter. Whatever our lot in life is, we always want to change it. We always want to change it. We want new clothing, new hairstyle. We want to work out at the gym and look different. We want to get a different car. We want to get a different apartment. We want to get a different job. We want to get a different husband. We want to get a different wife. We want to, get, you know, and and why? Because we're not really happy with what we have. Or maybe you say, well, you know, I'm fairly happy, but I could be a lot happier if I could get rid of that woman of mine, you know, and I could run off with that schoolmate that lost you know lost her husband I think we could hit it off pretty good Paul you know sets a good example for us in Philippians 4 and here's really the answer to it Philippians 4 Verse 11, you know, he's he's talking to them about, you know, being without and so on. He thanked the Philippians because he said they came to him once, twice, in fact. Came to his rescue, you know, when he needed help. And none of the other churches helped him out, and and they helped him out. And he was very thankful that. And he said, "Not, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned... In whatsoever state I am, therein, or therewith, to be content. And uh, that word content in Strong's means self-complacent, contended to a fault. <laughs> to be, you know, you say, you know, he, he, he's given, he, he's so giving and loving to a fault. He gives and loves so much that people take advantage of him, you know, that sort of thing, see. Eager to please, cheerfully obliging. So that's what Paul, he learned to have that. Of course, it's, a, it's really a gift of God, you know, but, but he, 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 he had to certainly put forth the effort. And then it became his philosophy of life. Hey, you know, 
you fell among robbers or you was with you know had a hard winter and he was cold and he, you know he didn't always have a place to stay warm or the proper clothing it's, it's alright God will see me through you know it'll be alright but I know that if you're as human as I am that you have these feelings of inadequacy and some of you have other feelings that I don't think I do have anymore and some of you feel spiritually inadequate and you wonder whether or not you're going to make it or am I the called or am I the chosen uh, and if I'm only the call, how do I become the chosen uh, is God pleased with me Seems to me if he was pleased with me, I'd have more answers to my prayers. Things would be going better for me. I'd have a better job. Finances wouldn't be such a problem. My wife wouldn't be such a problem. My kids wouldn't be such a problem. My neighborhood wouldn't be such a problem. I wouldn't say I'd have such a problem with my heating and air conditioner and my car. Is always, you know, I just, if God were really for me, some of these things would run a little smoother, I would think. I don't think God is too pleased with me. Some of you have secret sins. When I say that, those of you have them, they're like a little chill just went up your back. Does Ray know? <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. Don't tell me your sins. No, I, 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 I really don't care. Not that I don't care about you or care for you. I mean, I don't care about your sins. They're all the same. You don't have you don't have an original sin in your body. You're just all copycats, all of you. But it's uh, it's not it's not pleasant to feel inadequate. It's not pleasant to wonder why you're not up to snuff. Are you up to snuff? Can you be up to I used to, but now I'm not. I was doing pretty good, but then I backslid, you know. And it's just condemning yourself. And uh, and you have people who think you're already nuts because you're following this this cult, you know. Right, he's a cult. And uh, just lots and lots and lots of things. All right, so we, we'll talk a little bit about this stuff, Okay. And I, I'm not trying to give you all a better self-image by puffing up your ego or, you know, doing something that is the last thing on God's earth you need is, 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 is a greater ego, you know. Not, not that a good self-image is, is an ungodly thing, you know. It depends where that confidence is that gives you a good self-image. You see what I'm saying? If you have a good self-image, why do you have a good self-image? Because I have confidence of Jesus Christ in me. Because I've felt like you, some of you feel, or some of you felt a little while ago, or some of you may feel tomorrow or next week. I mean, I've been through all that. And... uh, uh, Sometimes you say, well, this is, you know, I'll just come up in the in the resurrection of judgment, and that's just the way it'll be, you know, or whatever, you know, just, whatever. Case or else or all. But there are some things that 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 you can do and think about to give yourselves a certain peace of mind and a certain security that we really should have. And I, I'm sure not all of you have it, okay? Some of you grasp at learning more. i got to learn more about the i got to learn all this stuff for ASD. If I could just learn all this stuff, i got to learn, learn, learn. If i got to learn this stuff, i read all this stuff, i learn it, learn it, I'll get it down, I'll be there, I'll be one, I'll learn it. And some some of you are not meant to learn a lot of stuff. You know what I mean? Some people are not good learners. And it's not necessary that you learn all this stuff, you know. Some of the stuff that I teach, I give you all this teaching and all these scriptures and all these explanations and so on, and you can't remember it all. That's all right. 
Did you get anything out of it? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I know what you're saying. Is that, well, it's good. That's good. You're getting something out of it. You got a feeling. You got a, you got a sense of uh, appreciation. You got a sense of, uh, you know, I like God better. Uh, uh, I don't think God thinks I'm as bad as I think I'm so bad sometimes, you know. Uh, whatever goodness you got out of it, hang on to that. That's good. Don't worry about all the technical details. Okay? I think Paul sensed that, you know, people felt that way, and, and he certainly wanted to encourage them. I'm going to read a couple scriptures to you. To me, the eighth chapter of the book of Romans is one of the most profound chapters in the whole Bible. It's just. It's just, it's, I mean, it's just so much stuff in there. And good stuff, profound stuff, marvelous stuff. Romans 8, read it often. All right, let's read at least some of it, okay? Romans 8. Now, if you're sitting here and you put forth effort to get here, to drive a car, fill up the tank, pack your clothes, buy an airline ticket, Take off a word. To get here, you've got to know that God is drawing you to to something. You've got to know that, don't you? And if you're saying, I believe in this not-so-handsome Jesus who was diseased and bent over and in pain and suffering, where everybody says, why don't you heal yourself? I believe, I can see where God would do that. So that we could sense that I can be ugly and fat and diseased and I don't need to hang my head. The very Son of God lived that way. You say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to believe in this Jesus Christ. He could have been handsome and strong and powerful and looked like Charles Atlas and, you know, and all movie stars combined and all. He could have, you know, but it wouldn't have been good for his vanity, his human nature, you see. And God would rather have taken him the way that he was humble because he, he had nothing to be vain about, you see. But he had plenty to be vain about. As humbly as he was and as bent over criminal, he could still walk on water and raise the dead. And that could become a little point of vanity. If you would let it, you know. We say, okay, I want to believe in this Jesus Christ. I, I like the idea that God would be willing to figure out a way that he could die for his creation. He figured out a way where he could die for his creation. The only way he could do it, since he's God and eternal and immortal, he, he did it through the most precious thing he had, his son. You see? I'll prove to them, maybe they don't get it now, but one day, or maybe in the kingdom of God, they'll get it. They'll all know. That me, the God of creation, the God of the universe, I died for you. I didn't have to. I did it to show you that I love you. If you really love me, God, why don't you you die for me? And he says, okay, I'll do it. I mean, he couldn't... what, What else could he have done? What else can God do... To show us that he loves us. I'll die for you. I don't have to. I just volunteer. I'll die for you. Will that show you? Okay, that's pretty good. <laughs> you know, that's about as, you know, another crisis. Greater love has no man than this. We're not talking about man throwing himself on a hand grenade to save his buddies. We're talking about somebody who pulls the hand grenade when there's nobody to save. I'm just going to kill myself. Why? To show you that I love you. Wow! Why would you do that? Because I want you to know. No other reason. Wow! That's, that's insane. Who would do that? God. 
the one who does strange things. Strange work he has on this earth. Now, so you accept this Christ. You say, all right, he said, believe, I believe. You know, maybe I don't believe as good as I could, or should, but I believe. I'm, I'm going. I'm going that way. I'm going to, you're the man, Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Now, that's where you are. That's where you are. Except, you know, there's one escape clause. Paul said, unless you're faking it, unless you're just a total fraud. But if you do believe in Jesus, if you do, and in your heart you say, yes, I do, I really do, then this is your lot in life. There is therefore now no condemnation in them which are in Christ Jesus. None. There is no condemnation in you. None. Well, surely some for for the sins and the, none. But I'm not as perfect as I'm not as good as you are, right? None. There is no condemnation in you. This idea that God beats you to death with his wrath and anger and indignation till the day you die is satanic heresy. There is no condemnation in those who are in Christ Jesus. None. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Oh, Ray, now you blew it though. See, I still do walk after the flesh sometimes. (laughs) But where do you want to walk? Well, I want to walk after the Spirit. All right, you're back in. (laughs) <laughs> for the law of the spirit of, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Now, if you find yourself starting to mind the things of the flesh, you need to pray to God and cry out for Him to help you and save you from that situation. You say, this is not me, God. I don't want to go here. I don't want to do this. But my flesh is pulling me, and I'm at war. I need help. I need reinforcements. And you cry out to God, and that humbles you, because you see that you can't do it. If you could do it, then you would become self-sufficient, and you wouldn't need God. You need God. He will always make you dependent on Him. Jesus always prayed. Why? He was the Son of God. What did He need to pray for? Because He knew that if the Father didn't do it, it wouldn't be done. Simple as that. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity or hatred against God, is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So they that are, are, are in the flesh, they cannot please God. Notice it. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit of light, but is, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or or bring to life your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwell in you. Verse 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Verse 19, 
Verse 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. This is God's work. He put us in these bodies of corruption. He put us in these bodies that want to sin and, and, and follow after lustful, foolish, stupid, you know, sensual, fun, fuzzy things. But if in your heart and mind you don't want that anymore, not that you don't want it, you do want it, but you don't want to want it. And so you cry at the God and say, I, I want it, but I don't want to want it. I don't want to want it. And then God is your father. He'll come to your rescue just like any father will come to any child's rescue and it cries out to him. You see? Likewise, the Spirit helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, or according to what must be, you know, what what absolutely is God's plan that cannot be deviated from. We don't always know what that is, but God's Spirit helps us to pray so that we will pray in accordance with with what, what needs to be, what needs to be God's will and God's plan and God's purpose fulfilled in us. And he that searches the hearts and knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that, and here it should read, God works all things together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, these he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them also he calls, who he calls, those he justifies, and them he glorifies. Now we come back to the same attitude as in verse 1. What shall we say then of these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Well, is God for us? Well, yeah, he's for those that he's calling according to his purpose and plan and all of that. But I don't know that everyone sitting in here is in that category. But I'll tell you what, if if you're not in that category, you're probably not too concerned about it. That's why I tell everybody, I get these emails all the time, about one a week, every ten days. Maybe not quite. It seems like it. somebody, I don't send these all to the forum because they could become so redundant after. But people think they committed the unpardonable sin, and it's always me. Because, you know, what I, I really, Ray, I think I did, you know. I mean, I didn't want to, but I, you know, I think I did. I think I blasphemed the Holy Spirit, you know. I said, if you're worried about it, you didn't. I can tell you in the authority of Jesus Christ, if you're worried about it, you didn't. Because if you did, you wouldn't be worried about it. If you're concerned that I don't know if I'm doing everything I should for God, I need, I want to please God. If you're in that attitude, well then, for sure, you are not blaspheming the Holy Spirit of God. You would not have that attitude of concern and wanting to please God if you were blaspheming the Spirit of God. So get that out of your heads. If you are concerned for God, what He thinks of you, and and whether you're living right, if you're concerned about that, get it out of your head. You have not committed the unpardonable sin that can only be rectified in judgment. You see, you have not. So you're not there. Don't worry about that. It doesn't mean you don't have sins. It doesn't mean you have, don't have things need to be straightened up and cleaned up. But for sure, you did not blaspheme the Holy Spirit of God. Okay? So, if, but if God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own Son, but he delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? 
this idea that, that you know God is pouring out His wrath upon us because you know you know He's angry at us. It's, no, no, God is not angry with those that He's calling to be His sons and daughters. His anger is toward those who hate God and despise His Word and that He's going to bring severe judgment upon. He doesn't hate or He's not angry with His elect. So get that out of your head. I think God's not very pleased with me. I think God's just... Get it out of your head. He that spared not His Son but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not... With him also freely give us all things. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is ever at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Christ is like a high priest who makes intercession for us because he lived in the flesh he knows exactly how it is and he makes intercession for us who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall tribulation no distress no persecution no famine no nakedness or peril or sort no as it is written For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. They're one. (laughs) It's the love of God in Jesus to and for us. Okay? So, don't, don't be condemning yourself. You know, you're you're on your way to live in you know the king's house and the king's palace and you know you're you're on your road to to royalty you know heavenly royalty and God has called you to that so don't don't feel that oh woe is me I'm not up to it I'm not pleasing God and he, none of us are perfect none of us do it right all the time but where is your heart what do you do most of the time? Do you talk to God? Are you always on top of your game, so to speak? <clears throat> what do you think about all day long? As a man thinketh, so is he. Okay, You are what you think about. You think about good things, you become a good person. You think about ways to love your, your wife or your husband or your children or whatever, then you end up, you do those things. See, you do those things. Or or your, your brothers, your sisters, your fellow man, people at work, whatever, you know. You don't need to be, you don't need to go overboard and, you know, just pretend to be this, you know, super Christian uh, where it becomes, you know, almost obscene, you know, where everybody says, oh, what a phony he is. You know, make it real. You know, make it real. You know, you, you, you can do the right thing behind the scenes so many times. People won't even recognize that you're always doing the right thing because it isn't something you have to parade. See? You don't have to parade it or wave a banner. Just do the right thing. Yeah? And do it because God's watching, not because people are watching. <clears throat> 